thanks very much. I'm competing with Sunshine, so it's amazing you folks decided to come into this rather dour spot instead. Um, thank you very much. Um, Senator Edward W. Brook is someone I obviously knew about because I grew up here and I've got enough gray hairs to prove that I remember when he got elected to most of the, of the things he was elected to. Um, but he's sort of fallen out of the history books for a lot of people. Uh, and just by chance, this is my prop and my cheat sheet, I stumbled upon the book he wrote in the early 2000s called Bridging the Divide, an Autobiography, um, which I, f I found fascinating. And uh, it made me uh, a little bit um, zealous to get him back on the map because he's a really interesting fellow. So that's what this presentation is about. I've actually given it at a few other places as well. Maybe some of you saw it. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to keep talking because I think he's a great guy. He's memorialized, as I'll mention later on, in a courthouse, but not a whole lot else. I'm going to do this chronologically for the most part. Ed Brook grew up in Washington, D.C. He was born in 1919. And he was born in this area called Le Droit or Le Droit Park. I have not found how locals pronounce that yet, so I apologize. I've looked it up and can't find any, any information on it, which was a, a middle, to, maybe even upper middle class neighborhood, but predominantly black at this time. Um, and it's still there. Um, he described, I believe he actually used the word cocoon or something like that to describe his upbringing, his experiences as a black person in Washington, D.C. and in this neighborhood because Washington, D.C. was segregated, but it wasn't segregated the way the South was. People didn't get lynched on street corners for violating rules. Um, the, it was more, much more subtle. And I included this photograph from probably the late 1940s or early 1950s of men standing in line to get baseball tickets in Washington. And you can see it's an integrated line. There's whites and black people standing side by side, no drama there. But once you get in the park, there were separate sections for colored people, black people, Negroes, however, whichever term of art was being used at that time. So that, that's a good image of, of the world he grew up in. He attended and graduated from Howard University, which was one of the first of the traditionally all-black universities in 1941. It, it, as an aside, was founded in 1867. The first president to actually visit was Calvin Coolidge in 1924. Like lots of other things, its budget was, was impaired by the Depression. And again, interestingly, a bit of an aside, shortly after Brooke graduated, many of his fellow students or, or people younger than him began this business of occupying stools at local restaurants where they were normally de de uh, de declined service. And they kept doing this. It was a small effort, but um, A, there was no big deal made out, out of it, and B, it was probably an inauspicious time to be doing this with the war on the horizon and people not paying as much attention to civil rights issues. This, of course, was uh, replicated on a larger scale in North Carolina in the early 1960s, and eventually led to Woolworths uh, desegregating all of its lunch counters nationally. Um, like everybody else who was of, the, of that age, you ended up entering the service almost immediately. Again, this isn't a picture of, of Burke, but you can see the, the experience here of black people entering the service, but white people telling them what to do almost universally. However, with a college degree, um, Brooke became an officer in the 366th Combat Infantry Regiment, which in itself was a bit of, a, of an innovation because so often, not always, but so often over the course of American history, blacks were put into uh, positions of basically being service workers and uh, not in this case. And this unit was trained in Fort Devens. I'm guessing they chose Fort Devens because um, racial, po racial politics were less uh, of a factor in Massachusetts, but not absent. Um, I include this from 1946 just as an example of that very point. Um, after the war, a whole bunch of black nurses went on strike because they were degreed nurses working to help returning veterans and take care of their health care needs, and they were assigned to just wash floors for weeks at a time, and they finally said, this is too much. And their, the, their actions caused a permanent change in that policy. And of course, a few years later, um, President Truman fully integrated, or at least began the process of fully integrating the military. This is a picture of his unit in formation, uh, several hundred men there. And in the right front, there's a little circle from this particular image because I picked it up off of a website honoring uh, Mr. Fox, who ended up dying and posthumously, not until the 1990s, receiving a Congressional Medal of Honor. So typically, again, the 366th was sent 
to Europe or North, North Africa area, and initially just given rear guard duties, uh, you know, nothing in, involving combat because of um, probably largely prejudice, although we'll get to that more in a second. For those of you who aren't up on World War II history, um, before the big invasion of Normandy, the Allies cleared Germans out of, and, and Italian forces out of North Africa, then invaded Sicily, and then invaded Italy, um, which made some sense at the time because it was not as strongly defended as other parts of Europe, but it was no cakewalk. I uh, include smiling Albert Kesselring, who was famous for always smiling, even when he was <laughs> doing terrible things, and he was a, a genius of a, de of a defender. He knew how to defend very well, and Italy, with all its mountains and hills, was the ultimate defensible terrain, and he made the Allies pay in a lot of blood. One of the American generals, Mark Clark, is shown here. Um, he was pretty successful, but to show how tough this was on all combatants, white or black, after the war, a whole, almost everybody in a, one of the divisions signed a petition to Congress to have this guy censured or thrown out of the army for all the callous ways he'd thrown away lives in, his, in this campaign. And uh, one of the British units, there was a British and American invasion, actually mutinied and refused to go back into combat during this period. So that's a prequel to this slide. Um, the white commanding officer in charge of, of Brooke's unit said in his welcoming speech to them, I did not send for you. Your Negro newspapers, Negro politicians, and white friends have insisted on you seeing combat, and I shall see that you get combat and your share of casualties. So that's a pretty firm commitment to cast away lives, again, with the understanding that the whole campaign was pretty darn crude and awful. In particular, there was this Battle of Soma Colonia late in, I think in 1944, a, a, a woman has written this whole book called Braid, Braided in Fire, which examines this one little battle and includes the stories of Italian civilians caught in the middle and losing casualties and some of the Germans involved, and of course the black Americans. And according to her, two-thirds of the attacking units, not that whole regiment, but the people assigned to attack were killed in this attack on the American side, all, almost all black people. And I mentioned this fellow who was circled earlier on. Lieutenant Fox. He's actually buried in Whitman, Massachusetts, and that's his little grave marker, and he was belatedly uh, given a Congressional Medal of Honor for his services there. Brooke himself was involved in this, but then later he had this amazing adventure. It's like the stuff of, of a movie. He took off his uniform and traveled behind enemy lines uh, to find out what was going on in these various villages, and ab obviously he would have been short, shot or tortured because under the what limited rights soldiers have in, under various conventions, if you're out of uniform, you're out of luck. So he was taking a big chance. I'm, I'm not sure where, but somehow he acquired some Italian language, and he befriended some local Italians. And this family he ended up staying with was uh, had a, a you know daughter Remigia Ferrara Scacco, whom he later married. Two years later, they corresponded. Uh, starting after he left the area and had a, a long marriage, which unfortunately ended. We'll get to that. But he was awarded a Bronze Star for the campaign and uh, certainly came back with bigger ideas. Before the war was op over, the unit was broken up. Again, prejudice. It was considered not up to snuff. They weren't good enough. It wasn't, they hadn't bled enough, I guess. And they were broken up and sent to individual units as individual small groups or individuals to support units. Um, but there was this other war in the Pacific that still wasn't over. This was before the atomic bomb had been tested and proven or used. And this, this article mentions that the unit was about to be reassembled and shipped off to go through the same sort of thing on the Pacific. Of course, those big events with the bomb supervened, and that didn't happen. After the war, Brooke headed off to BU Law School, graduated in 1948. I don't think he mentions in his book, and I don't know why otherwise he would have headed there, except that it had a, a, a good reputation as being friendly toward people who were not just white male establishment folks. They had their first gra black graduate in 1877 and had subsequently welcomed women. And interestingly, another aside, I couldn't believe this, but the American Bar Association didn't even admit people of color until 1943. Crazy. Um, after he graduated, he was offered a job, job at a big Boston law firm, but he chose instead to start a solo practice, which is, you know, fairly gutsy for a, a new guy out of law, law school. But he saw a need in the uh, African American community and uh, set up to help folks there. And he also went almost immediately into politics as a Republican. And again, it's worth remembering. Um, re 
prior to the Great Society programs of LBJ, for the most part, many blacks viewed Democrat, the Democrat Party as the party of segregation and the Republican Party as the party of liberation, although in both cases those, those definitions you know, aren't 100% watertight, but that was the choice he and many other people made at that time to, to be Republican and to support that. He tried to run for state rep in 51, was unsuccessful, tried again, was unsuccessful, um, and then ran against future Mr. Maya, Kevin White, for Secretary of State in Massachusetts. And um, he was probably, you know, he could have done pretty well, maybe, but um, uh, White, who was nominally his friend, put out this bumper sticker that kind of, uh, the double entendre was probably a little bit too much and very unfortunate, but he lost. But he didn't quit. Um, John Volpe, who was a Republican governor at the time, gave him an appointment at the Boston Finance Agency, which I think still exists, but at that time it was a, a um, probably had a higher profile because Boston politics, like James Michael Curley, the, the Democrat mayor at the time, were infamously corrupt. And uh, the legislature, which was still at least part, I don't, I'm not sure if it was Republican dominated, but legislature wanted to look over the shoulder of Boston and find out what was going on. And this was the agency for doing this. Uh, the Globe, I think it was, described him as have the, having the tenacity of a terrier, where he restored to vigorous life an agency which many had thought moribund, and won a reputation as a corruption fighter, which was a good place to start when he ran for attorney general in 1962. He became the first African American to ever be elected attorney general in any state. He re reorganized the office, worked tirelessly, hours and hours into the night, and gained a reputation as a vigorous prosecutor and uh, also went after uh, some of the people in the former Governor Forrest Foster Furcolo's uh, administration. Um, and the, this Boston Strangler case, the infamous Boston Strangler case, happened while he was uh, in office. And he didn't solve that. His office ended up not having much to do with it. Had, they had uh, you know, good luck elsewhere through uh, word of mouth from within the prisons. but. Um, he was the first person to introduce data processing techniques to try to sift through and organize the hundreds of, you know, sometimes crazy, sometimes plausible bits of information they got in about this case, which was pretty innovative for 1962 when, you know, computers were hardly even a thing. Uh, so there he is in 1964 as Massachusetts Attorney General. Um, and I'll come back to this in a minute. He won a successful, successful, successful re-election in 1964. Very popular man. Um, and this was his home in Milton, where he, he uh, had his family with Remigia, I can never quite pronounce his wife's name, and two daughters. And there's Brooke and his family in, 19, in the early 1960s, his wife on the your far right, and his two daughters. Um, and just as an aside, I should mention his experience in Italy. He made much of the fact that when he went into these Italian areas out of uniform, he was not treated as a black person. He was just treated as anybody, perhaps because he was um, not as black as some people. He, he was of mixed race background. But he, he said people just treated him like, like an ordinary person, which was, I think, kind of an eye opener for him after his experiences in America and uh, you know, probably colored his, his uh, view of a lot of things. This is a picture from, I think, uh, Time magazine of um, Brooke, the pianist. I didn't realize he was so musical until I, I saw this, and his daughters and wife in about 1966, I think, or 65. Um, on the basis of his success as an attorney general, he decided to run for US Senate in 1966, which is a pretty big thing in those days. Um, and he first had to beat a Republican nominee, who was uh, Elliot Richardson, a very famous kind of old school family. He had all kinds of positions. Um, this loss for him was probably the beginning of a political decline. He was a you know kind of an up and coming guy and ended up never quite making, becoming that prominent. He had important roles subsequently, but Brooke was the man. And um, then he had to run against his, uh, dem the Democrat, Harvard-educated Kennedy protege, former governor Endicott Peabody. And I won't share the off-color um, aphorism about Endicott Peabody, but it's a funny one, maybe afterward. Um, and this, this is a good place to just put in another quick aside, rolling back to 1962, or Yes, 1962, when he had been first elected Attorney General. At that time, Governor Endicott Peabody was the governor. And they worked happily together. And astoundingly, Governor Ross Barnett from, I want to say Arkansas, I could be wrong about that, who had just 
excluded, personally excluded James Meredith from entering uh, the college there, came to Harvard to do something, maybe to speak or something, which nowadays seems appalling because we live in a much more politically correct age and no one who is an arch segregationist would be able to get within a, a mile of Harvard. Um, but he spoke and then he decided to go visit his opposite number, Governor Peabody. And Governor Peabody knew about this and tipped off Burke and said, I'm gonna be meeting with Ross Barnett. You should come join us when I you know, buzz you. So um, Peabody was behind his desk. Barnett was sitting in a chair in front of him and he said, oh, I'll have to have you meet my attorney general. And Burke came in and walked over to Ross Barnett and said, very nice to meet you, governor. And Ross Barnett you know, lost whatever color was in his face and reluctantly shook hands. But then they had a good, positive, professional conversation about law enforcement in their states his state in Massachusetts and so on. And you know, Brooke later retired, but that to me sums up Brooke. He wasn't one of the civil rights figures who was with the bullhorn or marching through the streets of, of Selma, but he just showed up and said, I'm here, deal with me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the most American, most successful person I can be, and you're gonna have to deal with it. And that I think was one of his great strengths. Um, so he won first landslide election in Massachusetts and became the first black senator ever elected in U.S. history and for clarification purposes during the Reconstruction when white northerners installed friendly legislators and before senators became popularly elected there were black senators appointed through that process but never elected directly by the people. So that's a, a small but important distinction but it doesn't detract at all. In fact it magnifies his accomplishments really. So, not January 1967, off to Washington, D.C. And onto the cover of Time Magazine. And he spoke at the NAACP convention that year, and I've, I've Googled a bunch of times, I still can't figure out which city this was in, but he was understandably one of the stars of the show, a uh, really important figure, again, just being himself um, and speaking out logically and forthrightly for things. He met with uh, President Johnson on this occasion, um, obviously well into, into the Great Society period and also the Vietnam War period. And he made a point of getting over to Vietnam to understand for himself what was going on. Here he's pictured with uh, Prime Minister Nguyen Cao Ki, who was part of the, the dominant uh, military that really ran that country at the time. And through the subsequent few years, he, he, he went back and forth between supporting the war and being not so sure about it. Um, I think along with many other veterans of World War II, there was a strong sense that you're called to duty, we have to put our shoulders to the wheel and do whatever our country asks. But he was also not someone who just did what everybody else did. He thought for himself and, and, uh, and uh, you know, made interesting decisions. Here he is again, star of the show at the 68 Republican Convention. And again, a picture of him in the Senate. And naturally, he was much in demand as a speaker. Very, he had a very important role in America at the time. Here he is at the 1968 Boston University commencement ceremony as a speaker. And um, then at the 1969 Wellesley College commencement, and some of you probably already know what happens next, but let's build up a little bit. Um, there was a soon to be famous student in this picture. You can probably recognize her. Um, and Brooks' lengthy speech, um, I guess you could, call, you could consider it conservative, but he essentially said, you people all have enormous privileges, you're educated, you're in a great place, you're going, you're a great school, you're going places. We have all this division in the country about civil rights, about the war. Don't just go to the barricades, don't just riot, don't just demonstrate, get into the seats of power, because you can, and make change that way. And, um, Hillary Rodham, who had um, remarks already prepared, deviated from them and went into a, a tirade, might be too strong of a word, but she very strongly condemned everything Brooks said and said he was out of touch with the times and the reality and you should mind your own business, and then went into her speech. And for that, uh, come, for that, for delivering that comeuppance to Brooks, she managed to get on the pages of Life magazine the next day and was soon um, discovering that fame was a nice thing, and, and she, as you know, has stayed in the limelight ever since. Um, again, this is just a quick aside. Senator Brooke uh, attended an event where they honored 
his predecessor, Leverett Salzenstahl, and I can't help but share the fact that I'm so old that I actually was bounced on Leverett Salzenstahl's knee at the McCrory depart department store in Shoppers World 70 years ago, six, no, not quite, 65 years ago. Um, he was an amazing figure. Uh, I'm not, again, I'm not quite sure the sequence of this, but here he is with Richard Nixon in Boston supporting the ticket. Um, again, Massachusetts was the only state that didn't vote for Nixon in 72. Despite that fact, the great animosity toward the president and toward the Republicans in general, he won re-election again. And um, what went on, as by way of thanks, to be the first Republican to, to suggest that Richard Nixon should resign because of the Watergate scandal, which did not endear him to a lot of Republicans. He's still, I think, viewed by some Republicans as a little too wishy-washy for then or now. But that was probably the prudent thing to do. Here's Brooke with his mother, Helen, after being presented the Man of the Year Award by the Mass Society of Washington on Capitol Hill in 1978. And 1978 was the pivotal, a pivotal year, perhaps the pivotal year for Brooke as a politician. Um, he sought a divorce from his wife, and after his death, Barbara Walters, whom, for whom I have no a admiration at all for a variety of reasons, al alleged that she had a lengthy affair with him. I don't know if, that's what, if that was true or if that's what happened, but in any case, he sought a divorce, and it was a very messy divorce. His kids, I think, almost never spoke to him subsequently. Um, but uh, uh, a up-and-coming attorney, uh, county attorney? I've forgotten the exact title, but um, John Kerry was the one who chased down all these salacious facts about him and alleged that he had been hiding money and so on. And apparently there was some truth to that, although probably if you delved into most divorce cases, you could find something that didn't quite pass the sniff test. I don't know. I'm uh, maybe too much of a defender of him. But in any case, it, was, uh, politic it became political hot potato, and he had a lot of trouble thereafter. He did manage to make it as part of his final campaign to Franklin for our bicentennial in 1978. Here he is waving to the crowds, and um, apparently the, the newspaper editors or the political establishment didn't think too much of him because there was this article uh, showing him hopping out of the car and campaigning, and when he'd been he'd been told there was no campaigning at this event, but um, you know you can't tell that to a politician, can you? Um, so the the article was pretty critical about Burke doing that, and here he is campaigning in Lynn, probably outside the GE factory, I'm guessing, in 1978. But he didn't make it. He was succeeded by Paul Songus, who was a fine person, and then subsequently by John Kerry when, when Songus left office as, as Senate, senators. Um, like most people who have succeeded in politics and have law background, you go into private practice, and you do pretty well. Um, he had a, a, a good and constructive life thereafter. Um, belatedly, I think, and I, I'm told with a lot of complaining, he was finally uh, honored by the, Brook, the naming of the Brook Courthouse in Boston, just off of Government Center. And he came back to campaign for Mitt Romney in 2002. And another remarkable thing, he could have shut up about this. He had a diagnosis as, as for, with male breast cancer, which most people, including me, didn't know was a thing. But he made a point of going public and sharing that information so that other people, men, would be aware of this possibility and seek appropriate medical care and hopefully avoid a, a negative outcome with that. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by George Bush in 2004, completed his autobiography in 2006, which I recommend. It's, it's a well-written and very interesting uh, life story as well as a perspective on our country at a very uh, difficult time. And in 2009, here he's receiving the Congressional Gold Medal, which says, I think a quote from him, America's greatness lies in its wondrous diversity. Our magnificent pluralism has made this country great. Our ever-widening diversity will keep us great. And another shot from that event, Brooke looking pretty happy. And with some well-known folks, Harry Reid, uh, Nancy Pelosi, and Barack Obama. And he died at a ripe old age 90, 90, of 95 in 2015 and is buried at the Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, he is also a, a, a part of this Le Ledroit Park, which features a trail marking the 
locations of uh, various famous African Americans. I believe um, Edward Kennedy, Duke Ellington lived there, among other folks uh, of, of prominence. So if you're in DC and you want to do some interesting walking, go there. Um, and this is a quote from an interview he did with the Vineyard Gazette. He was a longtime uh, resident on, on the Vineyard. They said, Brooke is a Republican, a Democrat state. He's a Protestant in a Catholic state, and he's black in a white state. He's a carpetbagger, and he's poor. I said, I plead guilty at all that. Now go out and vote for me. But I never felt overt racism during my whole political career in Massachusetts. I wanted to prove that white voters will vote, will vote for qualified black candidates. Um, so that's my presentation. I thank you for listening. Uh, my knowledge is not as deep as I'd like it to be, but I will attempt to answer questions or refer you to page something or other in this book. Thank you. This program was made possible by your Franklin friends and neighbors. Good folks, just like you. Thanks for supporting Franklin TV. And thanks for watching.